WNPR is beginning a year-long focus on small business with its new Small Business Project. Politicians pay a lot of lip service to the needs and the importance of small business, but they rarely define what they're talking about. So we thought we'd start there and try to find out. Exactly what is a small business? WNPR's Harriet Jones reports. All over the state, there are small businesses just like this. Hi, how are you? I'm good. I saved you some apple bread in case you're hungry. Oh, thank you. <laughs> My name is Jennifer Kaminsky, and I am the owner of Drake's Me's Kitchen LLC. I started the business three years ago with my mother, and my mother and I were very proud of ourselves that we spent an entire day to make a dozen pies. It was a very long, exhausting day. We sold all the pies, everybody loved them, and we said, okay, we're gonna make pies. Gracie May's kitchen in Griswold is what you might think of as a picture postcard small business. But did you know that this is also a small business? I'm Doug Rose, uh, president of Aero Gear Company in Windsor, Connecticut. Uh, we produce uh, gearboxes uh, for uh, jet engines and uh, helicopters mostly. We're about 140 employees. and. Uh, of course, we started out as a local um, manufacturing company to provide product for Pratt & Whitney, but we've expanded. our. We have Boeing as a customer and General Electric as a customer, and we have customers overseas now as well. Connecticut plays host to thousands of incredibly diverse enterprises that go by the name of small business. So what is a small business? It depends on who you ask. Three million in sales or 100 employees or less. When you're looking at Connecticut, you're probably looking at companies that have 100 or fewer employees. In our state law, small business is defined as a company that has fewer than 50 employees. For some purposes, it's under 25. In some cases, it's under 500. That's John Loban of the Connecticut Development Authority, CBIA economist Peter Joya, and the current and future secretaries of the state, Susan Bysowitz and Denise Merrill. In fact, the federal government has one set of definitions for a small business, and the state has another. So deciding if you qualify, and for what, can be complicated. Annie Chambers administers loan programs for SECTOR, the southeastern Connecticut enterprise region. We work with the federal parameters for school, small businesses, and I'll have to tell you, it's like a 55-page document. Some are restricted by um, income, some are restricted by number of employees, and some are no restrictions. In fact, she says it's likely that in her region of the state, perhaps only Pfizer, EB and the casinos would not qualify as small businesses. I think a lot of small businesses think, oh, I'm not eligible for small business financing because I've got 200 employees or I, you know, generate 10 million in sales. But they are. But on the other end, small business can also be very, very small. Stephen Lanza is editor of The Connecticut Economy, Yukon's quarterly on economic issues. Those who are even self-employed, just you know, working for themselves, I would argue that's a small business, whether they be eBay sellers or uh, independent contractors for, for companies that they used to work for in the, uh, in the past or you know, web page designers or whatever it might be, there's lots of them out, out there uh, in Connecticut and it's one area where we really do see some fairly robust growth. If these entrepreneurs don't form a business entity, they may not even register in state numbers. And there's the nub of the problem when you're defining a small business. With a sector that ranges from fruit pies to aerospace gearboxes, and from one employee to 500, designing services and effective policies to encourage this engine of our state economy is far from the simple slogan-making we sometimes hear on the stump. For WNPR, I'm Harriet Jones. WNPR's year-long small business project begins this month by examining and challenging commonly held assumptions. We frequently hear that small business is the engine of Connecticut's economy. WNPR's Harriet Jones reports on whether there is data to support that claim. Everyone says it. So as governor, understand that my focus will in fact be creation of jobs and the support of small businesses, which are going to create most of the jobs in this state. I mean, everyone says it. Small businesses are the heart of the American economy. They're responsible for half of all private sector jobs. And they create roughly 70% of all new jobs in the past decade. So it must be true, right? 
In fact, the data on small businesses and job creation is rather scattered and hard to pin down. Data on small businesses is tracked federally by the Small Business Administration and at the state level by various state agencies, principally the Secretary of the State's Office, which records business registrations, and the Department of Labour, which analyses employment by firm size. Susan Bysowitz stepped down as Secretary of the State last week after 12 years in office. 75% of the companies in our state are businesses between three and eight employees. So most good companies in Connecticut that are employing people are those small businesses. 90% of the jobs that were created in our state over the past 10 years have been created by companies of fewer than 50 people and in fact most of those companies are ones that have eight or fewer employees. By contrast, companies of over 500 people employ only about 15% of Connecticut's workforce. Of course, total employment is different from employment growth and job creation. According to an analysis by the Connecticut Technology Council, between 2006 and 2008, firms of under 100 people created more than 100,000 jobs in the state, while larger companies created only a few thousand. The Council's Matthew Nemerson says it's important to make the jump from the data to the real people involved. With only 1 or 2 percent of the companies supplying probably 40 percent of the growth, you want to make sure you know who those 5, 50, 200 companies are, and you want to be working them all the time. In Groton, Douglas Dickey has seen both sides of the coin. He worked for several years for Pfizer, a Fortune 500 company that has 4,000 employees in Connecticut alone. He was a chemist in the drug maker's manufacturing plant. Then he was laid off and took the plunge to begin his own business, Constitution Biofuels, turning waste vegetable oils from restaurants into heating oil and diesel fuel. It was tough at Pfizer because you have no control whatever over your destiny. And the way the economy's going, it seems like everyone's more expendable for larger companies. It seems like if, if everything's going to get done or anything's going to be really innovated, it's going to be someone who's starting their own business and taking the risk like that because the larger companies seem to be more risk adverse. That jives with a study published last summer by the National Bureau of Economic Research, which says that in fact it's not how big or how small a company is, but how young that matters when it comes to job creation. Gary LeBeau is a state senator and chair of the legislature's Commerce Committee. There are certain small businesses which are the engines of economic growth, and those are new businesses, businesses that are just starting capital formation and just getting into hiring. Those businesses are the businesses that show real economic growth in terms of real job hiring going forward, and particularly high technology, green jobs, innovative businesses, because that is where the growth is going to come. That is where we can change the future of Connecticut. State policymakers shaping economic strategies in this coming session must decide what story is really told by the numbers on small businesses and job creation. For WNPR, I'm Harriet Jones. Green construction is a pretty familiar concept these days, but did you also know there's a green way to remove a building? Instead of demolition, it's called deconstruction, and one small Connecticut business hopes to grow it into an industry. WNPR's Harriet Jones reports. Back in the 1930s, the town of Hamden built itself a brand new firehouse. Some seven decades later, it's no longer a firehouse, but it's still here on Putnam Avenue, and I'm visiting its present owner, Frank Poole. I'm a commercial photographer, and I have my photo studio here, which is the old garage where the trucks were. Well, we did a lot of work to it. It it was a mess. Put an incredible amount of sweat equity into the building. Every guy's dream, right, is to have his own firehouse. Well, I did it. (laughs) And now I have it. When Poole first moved into the building six years ago, he found a surprise in the basement. He shows me an old photo that's hanging in the hallway. So this is dated 1939. uh, And you can see the uh, bowling alleys sign is up. Bowling alleys downstairs. And I guess it was for the firemen, firemen's entertainment, and uh, people in the neighborhood. If you speak to anyone that grew up here during that time, everyone bowled here. Uh, Kids were uh, pin setters. You'll see their mechanical lanes when we go downstairs. And uh, everybody has a memory of coming here and bowling. 
It's part of the town's history, but now some of it has to go. Poole has to remove two of the bowling lanes because of a rot issue underneath. There were actually four lanes. Some water got in underneath, one against the far wall, and uh, there was no other way to get in there and get that wood out. So, and then I met Joe, and uh, you know he's finding a use for the, the alley wood, it's, which is great. It's beautiful wood. Joe is Joe DeRisi. He's the founder of Urban Miners, a deconstruction business based in Hamden. He and his workers are removing the two old bowling lanes carefully, piece by piece, because this isn't junk. It's very valuable. All of it is sold at this point. Probably could use another couple hundred square feet of it, but I don't have it. We sold some already to one of my customers who has a rental in downtown New Haven. She bought cabinets from a 1960s house in New Haven that I had, and she made countertops out of the bowling alley for those cabinets. Someone else made two picnic benches out of them, and then an architect has actually designed with a customer a room that has a table made out of bowling alley and also the floor, wall, and part of the ceiling. So. Apparently, bowling alley is suddenly a hot commodity, even though it's been sitting around forever. So. This is what urban miners does. Instead of demolishing structures, they take them apart for reuse or recycling. We don't encourage removing buildings, but if you have to do it, then you can save the building by taking all its components and integrating them back into another building. A bowling alley in the basement of an old firehouse is a unique circumstance, but DeRisi says deconstruction can be used on any structure. In a typical house in New England, you can pretty much reuse everything. We could say the ceiling panels and the insulation, etc. Painted drywall, uh, roof shingles uh, recycled and made into new roads. The uh, fixtures, the flooring, the framing material, uh, foundations sometimes, trim, bathroom fixtures, uh, can all be reused. He says the biggest challenge right now is to encourage a more robust market for used building materials. He's also keen to develop a skilled workforce. When the town of Hamden recently proposed demolishing about 20 structurally unsound houses that had been built on a landfill, DeRisi came up with a proposal. If we deconstruct these instead of demolish them, we could probably do it for the same cost or less. We're going to produce a lot of materials and we can employ local people to do the work. So this could be a very positive thing instead of something that looks very negative. With a grant from the Workforce Alliance, he's used the project to develop a training course for eight local people who are currently unemployed. They're completing 40 hours of theoretical coursework through Gateway Community College and will then put their new skills to use, deconstructing some of the condemned houses. Student Ocon McCullough has been unemployed for two years. I used to be also a a construction worker, you know, doing labor, helping the guys out with sheetrocking, taping, and and that nature. No, you didn't get to the practical part yet. You're looking forward to that? Yes, I am. I'm definitely looking forward to it. (laughs) Eric Edwards is also on the course. He's excited about his future prospects. You know, I could see a lot of uh, opportunity in this field of work, and it could produce some, you know, quality jobs for people who are looking for employment, because as we all know, finding a job is pretty tricky. There's a lot of frustrated people out there. I know because I'm one of them. (laughs) DeRisi says he hopes to be able to employ some of the students himself if he can bid for more work at the site, the next step in building a homegrown deconstruction industry. For WNPR... I'm Harriet Jones. The prolonged slump in the housing market has been tough on the economy, and tougher on anyone trying to sell their home. It's also been a trial for realtors, most of whom don't see a paycheck from one long-delayed sale to the next. WNPR's Harriet Jones reports. The kitchen has some granite. I mean, yeah, they're not matching, but all the, all the appliances are new. Jordan and Elizabeth Hudak are members of that rare species, serious home buyers. They're viewing a house in Avon. The garage seems like a good size. But it's also like the main attraction of the front of the house. You might think they're sitting pretty, but not so, says Elizabeth Hudak. People have said it's a buyer's market, but I haven't seen that yet. 
They've twice put in offers on homes they were interested in, only to see the seller in each case take the property off the market. It was just kind of unexpected. It was, whoa, not only did you reject our offer, but you didn't like it so much, you took <laughs> you your house the off the market. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jordan Hudak says he sees a complete disconnect between sellers' expectations and the real market for homes. I think with the run-up with the housing boom, people saw home prices skyrocket and now that's kind of fallen apart. Um, they might have seen it as an investment or something, you know, I want to retire and this house is going to be what gets me there. And then, you know, when the home prices go down 25% in two years, people have a hard time accepting that, I guess. So far, the Hudaks, who relocated from Colorado in May, have looked at 68 homes in the greater Hartford area. In this economy, many haven't been maintained or upgraded to the standard they're looking for. According to their realtor, Berlin-based Mary Jean Agostini, this kind of mismatch is typical of the stalled market of the last few years. Buyers are very choosy about what they're looking for. They're very particular and they're very educated. Most people that are out looking now want a house that they can move into, all updated, turnkey. They just want to come and bring their clothes and start living. She says while the behavior of buyers and sellers is understandable given the economic conditions, it doesn't make life easy for realtors. Being in the business for 25 years, I've gone through three down markets, and this one is the worst. How are you? I'm good. Listen, I was just looking the other day at your 659 Main Street. In Middlebury, 18 agents work for the independent realty business of Bannon and Hebert. The market really peaked, believe it or not, in the second quarter of 05. Co-owner Marianne Hebert says the down market has been longer than many people realize. That was the actual peak. People really didn't start talking about the market decline until mm, late 06, when we had started to see it already. We started seeing price reductions. We started seeing time on the market lag longer. Hebert started this business with her partner Donna Bannon in 1996. She says it's only because they saved money during the hot market of the early 2000s that they've been able to sustain the company in these lean times. We've always been pretty conservative. When the market was really good, we always remind ourselves that we lived through the late 80s, early 90s, and that things do turn. At the height of the market, Bannon and Hebert employed 26 agents, all of whom work entirely on commission. That's now down to 18. It's been hard on a lot of our agents. It's been very, very hard on a lot of our agents. They, you know, people can work for months and months and months and not get a paycheck because a a prolonged closing or closings fall through or sometimes it just takes that long to get something to sell. And she says that's a familiar story throughout the state. Probably in 2007, I think our membership of the Connecticut Association of Realtors was close to 18,000 members. It's probably just under, just about 16,000 right now. Every day between what the federal government, what the local government, and unfortunately what sometimes the news media reports, we get hammered. Independent realtor Jean Fercadini is the current president of the Connecticut Association of Realtors. I see the front page of our, our Waterbury paper says, you know, um, housing market drops another 3%. Well, that's true in Vegas, that's true in California, but it's not true in Connecticut. He says while it is a difficult market, national doom and gloom over housing sales unnecessarily depresses sellers here in the state. But Connecticut does face challenges. The association mounted a fierce lobbying campaign earlier this year against the conveyance tax, a revenue-raising idea in Governor Malloy's budget. While they were successful in turning back a proposal for a conveyance tax on buyers, the existing seller's conveyance tax was made permanent and was raised from July 1st. I would say 95% of the people are just shocked that there's even that tax there. A lot of people will say, well, rather than list my house today, I'd like to think this over. You can put a conveyance tax on a property that can take somebody right out of the picture of affordability. Fercadini says he doesn't yet see a willingness at the capital to shape policies that will revive an industry that was once a driver of the economy. For WNPR, I'm Harriet Jones. Big box stores are under pressure. A drastic drop in consumer spending has gone along with a shift to make purchases online. But what does all this mean for the small independent retailer? WNPR's Harriet Jones reports it may actually represent an opportunity for the Main Street mom-and-pop store. 
the retail industry is in turmoil. Era, Borders bookstores announced they're shutting down nearly 400 locations. Retailer Gap plans to close over 100 more of its stores in the U.S. A national home improvement chain is closing 20 of its stores across. But while big box stores come and go, some things remain the same. I'm spot farming some uh, radiators. I sand it down in bare steel. Want to brush it or spray it? Probably brush, brush it. Brush it. Okay. I want to be able to paint latex over. Is that going to be a problem? No. This okay, is good. Parsons Hardware in the Unionville section of Farmington, where Michael Parsons has been answering customers' questions for more than 40 years, ever since he started helping out his father at the age of 10. Up in the front, we have the lawn and garden stuff, so you can see it right when you come in the door. Uh, in a couple of weeks, it'll be Christmas items up here. In fact, Michael is the fifth generation of the Parsons family to run this store, which has been open in town for 137 years. I think the thing that keeps people coming back is the family-friendly service here, you know? People come in the store, they want to get what they want to get and move on, not hang around waiting to get waited on. He's seen the advent of the big box era. A Home Depot opened up the road in Bristol about a decade ago, and within the last few years, small independent hardware stores in Bristol and Plainville have closed. But Parsons says so far his clientele remains loyal. Well, a lot of people have started out going to the Lowe's and the Home Depots and end up coming back here. His customers confirm it's the service and the convenience that keeps them coming back. Anthony Ricucci came in looking for a replacement chuck key for his drill. I'm actually working at the place right now, it's right up the street, so I, I walk here and get paint and paint supplies and random parts. You don't have to walk around the store for 20, 30 minutes to find what you need. It's right, it's right here. And Art Gray, who's lived in town since the 1960s, remembers a previous generation of the Parsons family. When his dad used to run it, he opened the store on a Sunday, I'd get a bag of grass seed or have a beer with him. And he was always open whenever you needed him, you know, he was a great guy. Gray says he's convinced there has to be a place for the independent retailer. You know, Walmart and all these other big ones kind of hurt, hurt the little guy, but you know, Mike is still there. He'll be here for a while. The town of Farmington has an unusually wide mix of retail. It plays host to the huge West Farms Mall on one hand and the walkable Farmington and Unionville centres on the other. Courtney Hendrickson is Economic Development Director for the town. It's her job to strike a balance between big national chains and small specialty retailers. Some towns lend themselves better to just one or the other if they're smaller towns or if they only have one type of feel. But because we do have the highway on and off ramps and then we have the sort of smaller village feel, I think that just adds to our quality of life here. While Hendrickson must balance the interests of both types of retail, some towns have put all their eggs in the independent basket. There's a growing buy-local movement encouraging support of small retailers. A national survey conducted earlier this year showed that shops in towns with buy-local campaigns experience stronger revenue growth. The survey was conducted by the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. Researcher Stacey Mitchell says consumers' buying habits really can be influenced by awareness campaigns. One of the biggest pieces of information I think can be a real motivator is the fact that about three times as much money stays in the local economy if you choose an independent retailer over a chain. Some studies show that about 15 cents of each dollar spent in a national chain store will be reinvested in the local community, whereas about 50 cents of each dollar spent in an independent retailer recirculates locally. But as the big boxes struggle... Are mom and pop stores also feeling the pressure of contraction in consumer spending? Most local retailers should view this as an opportunity to uh, to gain share of wallet from the consumer. Michael Dart is a retail analyst from management consultancy Kurt Salmon and author of the book The New Rules of Retail. He says big box retail may not fit into people's lifestyles quite so well as once it did. Big box retailers perched themselves on the outskirts of towns quite a lot and people were driving to them. Increasingly, I think you're seeing more neighborhood shopping, more convenience-based shopping. And at the same time, you've got convenience-based e-commerce shopping where people are having a lot of goods delivered as well. In effect, he says small neighborhood shops may be better equipped to withstand the onslaught of internet retailing. And that onslaught is continuing. A survey of holiday shopping intentions from the National Retail Federation found that 47% of us intend to buy online this year. For WNPR, I'm Harriet Jones. Most storm clouds have a silver lining, and the freak October snowfall was no exception. 
Connecticut's tree companies have work ahead for them for many, many months. WNPR's Harriet Jones reports. In Vernon, Sue Peterson is surveying the scene of devastation in her front yard. It was a huge Norway maple, huge, huge tree. She was in the dark after her power failed on the Saturday night of the storm. And um, as the night wore on, you know, we could hear the trees just cracking and creaking and thudding when they hit the ground. And then around 11 o'clock that night is when our maple tree in the front split and half landed on the house. She says it was very frightening, but it could have been worse. Fortunately, from what it looks like, it hasn't breached the roof, but there is you know, damage. There is a seven-foot-long crack in the bedroom ceiling, and um, I'm concerned about structural damage. I've been cutting for 20 years, you know, and I've never seen it this bad. Justin St. Peter of New England Tree Experts, based in East Hartford, confirms that Peterson is relatively lucky. You know, there's people that got tree branches right through their house, right through, right through the first and second floor, you know, inside cutting the wood out so we can get the limbs out of the house, and it's pretty, it's pretty bad. New England Tree Experts was receiving as many as a thousand calls per day all through last week from homeowners in dire straits. St. Peter estimates he worked 80 hours in the five days after the storm, and he says they've had to prioritize only those callers in true emergency situations. But he cautions anyone who still hasn't had professional help to be careful. People are going outside with ladders and trying to do stuff themselves. And when the trees fall, they're like spring-loaded and, you know, they're very dangerous just to cut. People, they want to get their house back, you know, they want to get their yard back, but you're better off calling a professional and letting somebody take care of it for you. That scene in Vernon is being repeated in thousands of other front yards all across the state. Mark Garvin is president of the Tree Care Industry Association. He was coincidentally in Hartford last week for a tree care expo. He says this storm and before it Hurricane Irene have lifted his industry's fortunes. Most of our members were having actually very good years. Now it's going to be a tremendous year. Things seem to have turned around in our industry. We uh, usually are a bit of a lagging indicator, but most of the members I've talked to here uh, had very good years this year. Connecticut has temporarily lifted restrictions on arborists not licensed in the state, allowing them to work here. But Garvin warns that while there are plenty of reputable companies coming in, major storms are always followed by scam artists trying to take advantage of desperate homeowners. And there are a lot of out-of-town tree companies here. And unfortunately, there's going to be some out-of-town unscrupulous tree companies who are going to ask for cash up front, and then they will disappear. Under no circumstances should any homeowner pay any tree company for any work beforehand. Even as the immediate emergency tree work begins to slow, the pace may not slacken for tree professionals in Connecticut. I like to say that, you know, Connecticut residents are forest dwellers in many regards. Chris Martin heads the Forestry Division of the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. In effect, he's Connecticut's chief forester. We have over three and a half million people in our small little state, but uh, from an aerial view, uh, we are canopy covered. Uh, over 60% of the state, according to the USDA Forest Service, is forested. What's below that forest canopy is, is where the people live and where the utility lines are. And that reality has now moved front and centre, with a growing consensus from the governor on down that the situation is untenable. Martin says he hopes for moderation as decisions are taken on tree trimming and removal. There's going to be a lot of debate on this coming down this le next legislative session. And uh, Connecticut is, is uh, I would say, blessed with many, many tree professionals. So there's going to be a lot of uh, input from, a, I hope, from a broad array of uh, folks interested in trees and also in keeping continuity of power to houses. He says some towns that have cut back on their trees have discovered a downside. Trees in general reduce energy costs over their lifespan. And we know in Worcester, Massachusetts, where there's been incredible tree removal due to the Asian longhorn beetle, neighborhoods that were once tree-lined and shaded the individual homeowners' costs and sometimes have doubled. Back in Vernon, as the tree company's chainsaws continue working, turning her Norway maple into just so much firewood and brush, Sue Peterson is trying to see the silver lining also. We had so many leaves to rake, so I said to my daughter, the blessing is we won't have to rake leaves this fall, so that'll be good. For WNPR, I'm Harriet Jones.